In this video, let's put everything together from module zero. So we're going to revisit everything that we've seen in the notes and in the videos. And I'm gonna walk through the, the 10 questions that you see here. And these questions are going to mimic the, the 10 questions that you're going to see in the actual gateway in Blackboard. So be sure to complete this on your own and use this video as, as reference for understanding things completely. So number one, let's round 0 0.312759 to four decimal places. So I'm gonna identify four numbers after my decimal point. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the number immediately following, let's, let's highlight our number immediately following the rounding digit. And so since that number after the rounding digit is five, remember if the number after the rounding digit is five or more, then the rounding digit's going to be going up by one. So in this case, the seven is gonna be going up to an eight. So rounded to four decimal places, our answer is 0 0.3128. In question two, let's round 0 0.7976 to two decimal places. So I approach this the exact same way. I'm going, to, I'm going to identify the number immediately following my rounding digit. And since the number immediately following the rounding digit is five or more, because seven is greater than five, we are going to increase our rounding digit by one. There's a couple different ways of approaching this. And one way is if you're just adding one to nine, nine and one is 10, you carry the one, seven and one is eight. Remember, all of this is just after your decimal point. And so 0 0.7976, when rounded to two decimal places, becomes 0 0.80. The other way of approaching this is you might remember in one of the earlier videos, I had mentioned taking the number that's after the decimal point. So we have 0 0.79, and we know that we're trying to bump up this rounding digit by one. You can take the number that's after the decimal, the 79, which stands for 79 hundredths, and you're adding one more hundredth to that. And so you could simply say, what's 79 hundredths plus one hundredth? Well, that gives you 80 hundredths, and 80 hundredths is exactly what you get when you put in 80 immediately after the decimal point. So a couple different ways of approaching that. Number three, let's express the number 1.5139e minus three in standard form. So we recognize that our calculator is going to give us answers like this at times. And what we need to do is we need to recognize that this is in scientific notation and we need to move our decimal point three places to the left in this case. So moving here, let me rewrite this, 1.5139, and I'll even write it as times 10 to the negative three power. I'm going to move that decimal point three places to the left to get my number in standard form. So in standard form, this becomes 0 0.0015139. And now we're rounding to three decimal places, so I identify three numbers after my decimal point. Once again, I look at the, the number following that rounding digit. And since the number following that rounding digit is five, remember if it's five or more, then you're going to bump that rounding digit up by one. And so bumping that this up by one leads us to a final answer of 0 0.002. Okay, let's go on to question four. So question four says, suppose there's a 20% chance of raining each of the next three days. The probability that it rains at least once over the next three days is going to be one minus 0 0.8 raised to the third power. Let's express this probability as a decimal and then round to three decimal places. So this is where you go to the calculator and you enter one minus 0 0.8 raised to the third power. Uh, we, we actually don't need in the calculator parentheses around the 0 0.8 because the power is only being applied to the 0 0.8 here. So we can just press enter and we can get an answer here of 0 0.488. So let's, let's write that down. So 0 0.488. Um, so our answer is expressed as a decimal automatically based upon what the calculator is giving us. We're going to round to three decimal places. Well, we don't have any rounding to do because we have precisely three decimal places uh, in the answer that the calculator provided. So that is our answer right here, 0 0.488. Okay, and number five, this is a pretty complicated looking formula. Um, and this is a formula that you'll see later in the course. 
Uh, and so we're just going to do some substitutions into this right now and see if we can calculate n. And so notice that we have a number for z. So we're going to be substituting in 1.96 where we see z. We see a number for this variable here that is known as sigma. You're going to get really comfortable with, with this language in this class. So we're going to be plugging in 5.72 for sigma. We're going to be plugging in 1.5 for m. And then we're going to be calculating and rounding our answer to the nearest whole number. So let's do this. Let's say n is equal to, I'm going to use the parentheses here. So we're going to have 1.96. That's multiplied by, 1.96 is being multiplied by sigma, which is 5.72. And then we're going to be dividing that by m which is 1.5, closing the parentheses, and then we're squaring the whole thing. And once we do this, and we're obviously going to be doing this in the calculator, we will round to the nearest whole number. So let's go into the calculator, and, uh, and let's plug this in. Let's say 1.96, and notice I did start with opening the parentheses here, because we have to take this entire quantity and square it. So we have 1.96 multiplied by 5.5. 72 divided by because when you have that that big bar there that fraction bar that stands for division divided by 1.5 close the parentheses and then we can either use the caret and then number two or you can just press the x squared button and when you press enter you get an answer of 55 you get 55.8 six two six six nine zero eight but we are rounding to the nearest whole number so this is 55.8 and so notice uh, if we're rounding to the nearest whole number this is actually our rounding digit i know we didn't really in the videos and the notes round to the nearest whole number but we're essentially choosing between 55 or 56 and uh, if you're rounding the nearest whole number you're looking at the number immediately after your rounding digit, and since this is our rounding digit, we're going to say, okay, since this number is greater than 5, then we would say our nearest whole number is actually going to be 56. And in the context of statistics, later on, this is going to have some meaning for you. So our answer here is n is equal to 56. All right, let's go on to the next question. In question 6, we're asked to compute the standard deviation of the x-bar distribution given sigma is equal to 2.4. So we are going to be evaluating an expression here where we plug 2.4 in for sigma, 125 for n, and let's use the calculator to help us out. And we will round our answer to four decimal places. So, um, so the standard deviation of the x-bar distribution is equal to, we have 2.4 divided by the square root of n, and n is 125. So I'm just going to go over to the calculator and substitute these things in. And so we have 2.4 divided by second x squared, that's how we access the square root button, 125. Press enter and we get an answer of 0 0.21466 and so let's write this down, 0 0.21466. And uh, let's do what we've done in all of our rounding problems where we identify that we are rounding, in this case, to four decimal places. So I, a lot of times we have been underlining uh, four numbers past the decimal point, and then I'm identifying the number immediately after the rounding digit. In this case, since that number is five or greater, 6 is greater than 5, then the rounding digit is going to go up by 1. So rounded to four decimal places, our answer for number 6 is going to be 0 0.2147. That's 6. That 6 ends up getting bumped up to 7. Okay, question 7. Is the following statement true or false? We're comparing our numbers. And uh, not only are we comparing the numbers, uh, we're trying to determine is this number on the left greater than or equal to the number on the right? And so when I'm looking at the numbers, I can see that they both start with zero. And then I have a two immediately after the decimal point. And then I have a nine with this number, but a three on this number. 
So that's telling me that the number on the right is actually going to be the larger of the two numbers. However, this is read currently as 0 0.23918 is greater than or equal to 0 0.29713. That is not true because the bigger number is actually on the right. And so this statement is false. Okay, question eight. Determine if the p-value is less than or equal to the a-value. So let's substitute in the p-value into this expression or this inequality expression right here and then see if, uh, you know, when we substitute in the a value and maybe do a little bit of rearranging because we have some scientific notation, let's see if the p value is less than or equal to a. So I'm going to substitute in p and a and we get uh, 7.3 times 10 to the negative 4. Let's see if that is less than or equal to 0 0.005. And so let's take 7.3 times 10 to the negative 4 out of scientific notation. So let's move our decimal 1, 2, 3, 4 places to the left. And we end up getting an answer of 0. Point. We're going to have three zeros after the, the decimal point. 0, 0, 0, 7, 3. And so the question is, is this number less than or equal to 0. 0.005? So that's our question. And as we compare our numbers, we see that we have three zeros immediately after the decimal point here, but we only have two zeros on this one. And so this is going to be the bigger number, which is what makes sense based upon how this is written, because 0 0.00073 is smaller than 0 0.005. So this statement is true. So P is less than or equal to A. And so you could simply state here, yes. Uh, P is less than or equal to A, or you could say this, this statement is a true statement. Okay, a couple more questions now. In number nine, let's suppose the mean number of computers X in a household can be estimated with the following interval. So X is somewhere between 1.4 and 2.7. That's how I want you to be able to read this. Of course, you can read this as 1.4 is less than X is less than 2.7. But it makes a lot of sense when you say the mean number of computers X is somewhere between 1.4 and 2.7. So is it reasonable to conclude, given this interval here, is it reasonable to conclude that the mean number of computers in a household is more than one? Okay, so let's go back to this statement. This statement is saying that the mean number of computers in a household is somewhere between 1.4 and 2.7. So is the mean number of computers in a household going to be more than one based upon what this interval is suggesting? Yes, because the mean number of computers in a household is, is going to be somewhere between 1.4 and 2.7, which is more than one. So you would say yes to this question. It is reasonable. Okay. And the very last question, Number 10, the following equation models the total cost Y to take a college statistics class that is X total credits. Okay, so remember it doesn't hurt to write in what your variables represent. So the total cost here is equal to $60, must be a connect sign up fee, plus $95 multiplied by the number of credit hours. Okay, so you got multiplied by the number of credit hours. So the question here is, how much does the total cost Y differ when the total number of credits differs by one? And so hopefully this language rings a bell. Again, look at this. We're, look, we're asking how much does the total cost Y differ when the total number of credits differs by one? So this is getting at the definition and the idea of slope. And so you might even remember in a previous video, I would sometimes write the slope, which is the number in front of x over one. And I was stressing in that, in that video that the way that we're going to be interpreting slope in this class is uh, this number that's in front of x represents how much the y values, two y values would differ so in this case, how much the total cost to take a statistics class would differ 
when the total number of credit hours differs by one. Okay, and so essentially all you all you need to do to answer this question is is look at the the number in front of x, look at the slope of of 95, and and that's your answer. Um, but again, I think that the most important part of that is is when you look at a number in front of x in the you know when you're looking at an equation y equals a plus bx in statistics, that number in front of x, that b value, represents how much two y values would differ when your x values would differ by one. And so that's that's exactly what I'm asking you right here. And basically asking you to find slope without using the word slope and seeing if you understand that this wording is precisely what the slope is, what that b value is in front of x. Okay, so thanks for all of your hard work. Hopefully these videos have helped. And again, you you have these throughout the entire class. So if you need to come back to them, uh, you you always have access and uh and good luck go get that gateway and uh you know i hope you uh i hope you have success on it and lastly don't hesitate to reach out to your instructors for additional help on any of these topics or any other topics throughout the class i hope you enjoy statistics thanks